Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day, and before we get started, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is an anarcho-libertarian and Austrian economist and the founder of the Gold, Goats, and Guns blog, Tom Luongo. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Jesse. Appreciate the invite. Yes, I want to get started like I do with all guests with the origin story. So how did you first discover investing? How did that lead you to gold and to where you are today? Well, investing was easy. Uh, I threw some money in the markets during the dot-com bubble and I lost it all. And then I had to try and figure out why I lost it all. Uh, And that led me to... Honestly, I mean, the Lou Rockwell, the Mises Institute and all of that, where I tried to figure out what was going on, they had this, seemed to have the best explanation. And I just kind of ran with it from there. And so by the end of 2002, I was just, I was one of those people buying gold coins and stacking for the next uh, bull market. So, and that's sort of from there. And then slowly but surely over time, what's really happened is that when I was doing that, when I was a, a, a process and, and research chemist and uh, that was my, my my career at the time. So kind of similar to Dave Collum in that respect, right? I've had Dave on my podcast many times when we, we joke about, you know, two old chemists sit around, and, you know, bitch about markets. And it's kind of hilarious, actually. Um, and, you know, we just both took a, took a kind of weird path to becoming, you know, financial commentators on, on this stuff. Me, it became something out of necessity. My, my career ended in my mid-40s. And I'm like, guess I'm overqualified and undereducated. And that made me uh, underemployable. And so I just, I turned to writing basically. And uh, I fell in with a couple, I fell in with a, with a guy originally. And, and then that worked into a job at Newsmax, writing a letter, a newsletter for them. And then, you know, and then that job ended. And so I went into independent. Now I'm back with Newsmax and I have the independent thing. So it's all kind of, you know, a twisty, windy road as it were. Well, I want to touch on an article you recently wrote on your website called The ECB is Trapped Between Japan and the U.S., where you wrote about Christine Lagarde, if she doesn't follow Powell from here, then the capital flow out of Europe goes from a small stream in the backyard to a biblical flood, as the markets call bullshit, on the entirety of the ECB's mission. At that point, she wouldn't be able to defend either credit spreads or the euro. So could you expand on that for us and explain the conundrum the ECB finds itself in? Sure. The ECB can go bankrupt, unlike the Federal Reserve and unlike the BOJ. So the BOJ and the Fed can both print as much elastic money as they want in order to keep their banking systems uh, liquid during any kind of time mismatch or any time of, of kind of credit crisis. The ECB, on the other hand, doesn't have that option. Um, And because of that, they're in a very dangerous position because ultimately Powell's going to keep raising rates. She's behind the curve on on inflation over in Europe. Commodity inflation is coming back. Oil is going to close today, close to $86 a barrel Brent. Uh, The the Brent WTI spread is down under $4 and only going to get worse. It's only going to to continue to shrink. And the Biden administration refuses to uh, refill the strategic petroleum reserve and anything over $65 a barrel. So that's not going to change. They're doing all of this in order to keep inflation under control in Europe because Europe is a net energy importer. They have no, they have no real collateral at this point to undergird their, uh, their common currency. Germany's deindustrializing. France is uh, dealing with the, a revolt in North Africa, which is likely to spread continent-wide and end their um, colonial franc extraction system to finally end the French colonial, end France as a colonial power. Um, and, uh, and, they've, and both of those countries have gone out of their way to subjugate Italy, the third leg in the, in the EU tripod that would keep the EU, which makes up most of the GDP of, EU, of the EU. And without those three countries, there is no EU. So when you think of it in those terms, Lagarde has to keep raising rates, and she's only raising rates because she has to, because otherwise she has no credibility. Like, simply put, you know, she's still at negative nominal yields, or negative real yields, not nominal yields. She's at, ne- ne- she's at positive nominal yields, she's at negative real yields. Inflation is coming back for her. It's not going not to stop. We're just in a lull at this point because we went through a huge pump and dump in, across the entire commodity space, right? And that means, you know, lumber prices went, you know, from $4 a board, 100 board feet up to, you know, 
a portfolio up to $12 and back down again. Aluminum tripled in price and then collapsed. Oat prices went to $7 a bushel and back down into the fours. You know, all, all across the entire commodity space. And it's all a all downstream of, frankly, domestic wholesale gasoline prices here in the United States, which make up somewhere between 65 and 70% of the inflation we saw. And gasoline prices are rising. And oil prices are rising. So when you're thinking of it in those terms, there's no way for Lagarde to continue to hold European bond yields where they currently are. They need to rise. But she steadfastly refused to allow them to rise for the last nine months. She allowed the German 10-year, for example, to get to 2.5% and then no higher. And every time it tries to explode through 2.5%, she tamps it back down the next week, either through, um, you know, so through the manipulation of some headline. And today it's the jobs report. We were trending towards 2.61% on the German 10-year this morning. I sit down to chat with uh, with uh, Brent Johnson, San Diego Capital, for a, a podcast. I look up and... I checked the markets again, and we're looking at 2.53% on the German 10-year. And we're talking about the you know the entire American yield curve dropping 12 basis points and 15 basis points in an hour, two hours since the jobs report. What, are they out of their minds? Like yesterday, we were taught, we were looking at 4.3% on the, on the U.S. 30-year, and now all of a sudden we're, we're back down under 4.15. Hmm, I wonder why. It's always because somebody bombs the freaking market who has enough money to bomb the market to keep this from happening. Now, I have a number of theories as to why that is and who's showing up on various days, but the main culprit here is the ECB, period. And then the Treasury Department here in the United States helps because there's absolutely no love lost between Jenny Ellen and Jerome Powell, okay? Because they work for different people. Jerome Powell works for Wall Street, and Yellen works for what I like to call Davos. Davos is the old European colonial money. And that's when you think of it in those terms, it's pretty clear what the what the breakpoints are. And I've been saying this for two years now. And now everybody's finally starting to figure it out. So that's what's going on. Lagarde has no choices. She's caught in multiple Chinese finger traps. As a matter of fact, all four of her fingers are caught. She's trying to wriggle out of one of them, and she can't. And every time she tries to wriggle out, she catches another finger. And... She's stuck. And the reality is, is that I don't see a way out. And the and then when you bring Japan into it, because Japan has to end yield curve control, has to finally take their foot off the brake and the accelerator at the same time, which is what they've been doing. Um you know. Once the Bank of Japan starts to do this, there's no way that they can that that the ECB and or you know s- sympathizers in trying to hold this thing together can use the Japanese bond market as a piggy bank to go get capital to go buy U.S. Treasuries with, because now there's uncertainty and when the BOJ is going to step in and hold on you know and hold the markets in place. The way I described it the other day for my subscribers over at Newsmax was I said, imagine that all of this is that, that all of this is a big game of Texas Hold'em. Okay. And the fed for years would have aces and no one would believe them. And everybody would pile into the pot and it'd be a family pot and seven people after the flop and some guy with, you know, some guy with five, seven offsuit, you know, flops two pair and the fed is, and the feds aces are blown up. The ECB fronts, you know, whatever they have, they get they get the deal off the bottom of the deck no matter when no matter whenever they get into trouble and they get the river card they always need and the BOJ plays with their friggin' hole cards face up. That's been the game like the entire time that the ECB was at the negative bound and and the the BOJ was had yield curve control in place. And then um and the Fed played good hands and competently when when Yellen and Bernanke were you know, were at the helm. Basically, they would play. They they play their they fold their aces if they saw if a king flopped. Like it was just dumb, right? Um, so, and then yell, and then um, Powell takes over, starts raising rates, and nobody believes him because they all think he's just Jenny Ellen two point who's just Ben Bernanke two point So okay, and they're all just Greenspan two point right? So now that you have that as the backdrop, 
This is why the ECB is caught. There's no way out of this. As long as the whole European Union idea, the whole offshore euro dollar market leveraged to the hilt and then used, uh, you know, and then all of those dollars used as uh, cudgels to undermine the United States from within and undermine our monetary policy, that was only capable of sustaining itself as long as the Fed was compliant and was willing to go along with the whole thing. Well, clearly the Fed's not in compliant anymore. And Powell's like, no euro dollars for you. Raise rates. What? You, you, you can't raise rates. But, but climate change, raise rates. Um, how about fuck you? And then, you know, by the, oh, by the way, fuck you too. That's literally what Powell's been doing for two years. And finally, everybody's been, finally, everybody's starting to get the message. And now he's made the message so strongly that now the, now he can like introduce a little bit of, well, maybe not fuck you. Maybe a little, hey, you know, we can work on this a little bit, but you, but I have your attention now. Look into my eye, right? That kind of thing. And once you see it that way, you can't unsee it. And that's what I think is going on. And Lagarde is, is screwed. She has zero credibility anymore. And all she can do is apply tons of money that's been stuffed into mattresses and built up over the years. And they're, all this money that's coming in to support the European bond market is being drained from the system. And eventually they're going to run out because the problem with socialism is, of course, as Margaret Thatcher said, eventually you run out of other people's money. And the people who are putting that money on the table right now are all the, you know, all the people who got fat and happy uh, during the NERP years and the ZERP years. Now they have to, you know, keep raiding the piggy bank until they can't, until the piggy bank's empty. And that's nice. Couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of oligarchs. But these people need to go away. And they just do. Because they're evil. And I'm sorry, but I think that Powell understands this. And I don't call him a white knight. He's just working for Wall Street. Wall Street doesn't want to get doesn't want to get killed. Doesn't want to be you know, removed from the scene. So I, that, that's that's ultimately why I think this started. And I think that now that we're here, it looks a lot different, ultimately. And it looks like he we can actually pull this off. This is gonna this is gonna work. And now what we have to watch is where Janet Yellen is right now, it's just her job, is that she is like a dog that won't submit, like a, a, a misbehaved dog that won't submit, right? Or a misbehaved child that's having a temper tantrum. And she keeps throwing punches and she keeps kicking. And, she, and every time you see another move by Yellen, it's just another, it's just another temper tantrum. And Powell's just steadfastly holding his hand on her chest going, stop it. No, I'm in control. Stop it. Bad girl. No biscuit. No, 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 bad, bad Janet. No, eventually, this is what will. Eventually, it will work out. But you know what they keep hoping for is if we extend and pretend this system in the in these price bands as long as possible, we might be able to get a political victory that we can then use to undo all of this. And that's what they did when they installed Biden as president. That's what Biden being president was about. It was about getting rid of Trump to get political control over the United States. And then they were going to use political control over the United States to get monetary control over the United States. And it didn't work. Powell survived. And here we are. And it's kind of cool, actually. Yeah, I'd like you to expand on that um, theory. You, you're, you're saying, obviously, that Yellen and Powell are working for different teams, the old Davos money versus Wall Street. And you said, although Powell isn't a white knight, and you've mentioned this in, in a, an interview I saw with Kitco, where you said that he's fighting against the Great Reset agenda. Now, I assume that all central bankers are degenerate lying parasites and at their core, evil sociopaths. So could you maybe tell me why I'm wrong here in regards to Powell and, and why he could actually be sticking it to the globalists? Well, it's not that he doesn't want – it's not like the people he doesn't back don't want to be globalists themselves. It's that who's going to be in charge. Like you can look at it that way, and that would be an equally valid way of looking at it. I don't know that it's fully that way, but I can tell you that if, I had, if I'm Jerome Powell and I'm Jamie Dimon and I'm John Solomon over at uh, over Goldman Sachs and I'm – you know, I'm, I'm the, one of the CEOs of the big five banks in the United States. And I'm looking across the pond and I see Klaus von Kami Schnitzel wearing his Klingon outfit talking about how we're going to implant chips in everybody and up everybody's, you know, uh, you know uh, 
consciousness to the to the internet, and we're going to run run everybody's life with AI, and there's not going to, and we're going to, you know, have to eat bugs and live in pods and shit. I'm like, yeah, I just don't see the cigar chomping guys from the Hamptons like going along with that. Like, I'm enough of a New Yorker to know. Like, I'm 37 years removed from New York, but I'm enough of a New Yorker to know that those guys don't play that game. Like, that's just not happening. Like, really? You think that that's what you're going to do? Now, do I think that they had a choice pre-Trump to go along with this? No, I don't. The more I think about the history of the Federal Reserve and the history of the banking system post Lehman Brothers, when the system busted, the more I realize that they probably already knew that this was the plan and that they were going to be left by the wayside, but they weren't but they didn't have any way to deal with it. Obama was installed, this thing was running, and they didn't have any choice in the matter anymore. Until Trump. And then when Trump was given Powell to replace Yellen, and John Williams was put in charge of the New York Fed to implement SOFR and take us off a of LIBOR, that's when everything changed. And then it's been a five or six year rollout to go from the from introducing the idea of SOFR to implementing it completely, which is where we are now. Notice, we're a little over a month since LIBOR officially ended in the United States. Okay. And everything is now blowing up again. And I've been saying this for two years now. This is important. So Powell is working for Wall Street. Would Wall Street like to continue to run a a global financial system that benefits them at the end of, at the expense of everybody else? Sure. Are they better than a bunch of shitbag European commies wearing Klingon suits that want to put us in pods? Absolutely. As much as I hate the banksters, I'm going to go along with all, go along with all y'all. But got news for you. Bitcoin ain't going to fix this, and neither is gold. It's just not. Not in any time frame that matters to my lifetime or my daughter's lifetime. And that's what I have to deal with. I don't give a f about the math. The math may be correct. Mises and Rothbard and all those guys may be absolutely correct. Did they ever mention timing? No, because it's a qualitative argument. And yet somehow we have an entire community of people, thanks to Bitcoin, who think it's just math. Well, no, it's not just math. I hate this. I'm going to be. I'm going to be really, really obnoxious now. It's not math, Spurg boy. Put the Twinkie down, have a steak, clear your mind, and start thinking through this shit. And put a little testosterone into your veins, my, 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 my dude. Seriously, this is not the way the world works. I, if it did, it would be a lot easier to model, but it doesn't. There's a whole lot of people out there with a whole lot of power who are not going to just give it up because the math doesn't work. Please. And the truth of the matter is, is that the math does work if you reframe the entire argument. And I can reframe the entire argument for you in like three sentences. They killed a lot of grandmas during COVID, so we're not going to pay their Social Security, Medicare, and everything else. We have 8,133.5 tons of gold that we can throw out on the yield curve and pay a zero coupon bond against, or 1% coupon bond against, to deal with to, 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 to refinance the entire United States. Yeah, it's not going to be at $1,900 gold. It'll be $6,000 gold. So what? But the math, that math works. And if you don't think that math works, you're out of your mind. Like, don't sit here and tell me that we can't, that, you know, it all, ceteris paribus, all things being equal, which nothing ever is. Sure. 6%, 6 33 trillion dollars. Do the math. That, that's what the debt's going to be, and that's what the debt servicing is going to look like. That blows out the budget. Blah, 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 blah. The math doesn't work. Add in 150-some trillion dollars worth of unfunded liabilities, and yeah, the math doesn't work. Refinance all that debt over the next five years with a one with a 5% gold cover clause and a 1% coupon? Oops. Math works. 15 years from now, after everything's paid for, and the, and the smaller generations of Gen X... And the, the smaller generations are coming down the board and the entitlement programs have been completely reformed because, you know, you ran out of other people's money. 
And all of a sudden, that $150 trillion worth of unfunded liabilities is $40 trillion. The U.S. economy is $25 trillion a year. There's balance sheet room. There's this, there's this, there's that. Like, the math starts to work again. Like, don't, it's just dumb. So Powell understands all this. He's made it abundantly clear he understands all this. And the real question is, when you get into the murky parts of this, this is the stuff I didn't cover in, in the show like Kitco or whatever. You start getting into the murky stuff. I start asking questions like, do you really think the Fed is against Bitcoin, Tether, and gold? Yeah, they have been previously. But if they don't want the dollar to be the world's reserve currency anymore, they don't need to, that doesn't need to be true. As a matter of fact, I just outlined a, 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 a scenario for you where the Fed wants a higher gold price because that's how you're going to attract capital. Because here's the thing. If we don't do this, the bricks are. It, in the game of global capital, you don't have to be good. You don't have to be perfect. You don't even have to be gold. You just have to be better than the other guy. Okay? It's like the old adage about the bear. You don't have to be faster than the bear. Well, you just have to be faster than the other guy who's not as fast as the bear as you are. The last guy. That's it. That's the great game of global capital. Yeah, Bitcoin is, and or gold may be the bear. But, dude, I'm telling you, the bear could be 200 years off from catching us. And how are you going to invest in that? And why, and, and why should anybody listen to you about your arguments about 200 years from now? when your kids have been sold into freaking white slavery by a bunch of globalists who want to drink their adrenochrome or whatever. I'm not that I'm a, not, I'm just like throwing, I'm like, I'm like taking it all the way to the end. Not that I buy any of that, that stuff. This is dumb. Right. Um, but you know, you know, put together whatever evil conspiracy about these people you want. And like, yeah. Okay. So they win for another 200 years. Well, that's a solution. Really? That's no, what that says to me is that you're just too much of a pussy to actually fight for anything. And then I look at every one of these, like these hyper Bitcoiners like this, and I go, Oh, no wonder you can't get laid. Oh, okay. No wonder you're still in your mom's basement. Because, I mean, like, what woman, like, seriously, what woman would, would, would want, what serious woman would want that guy who's basically like walked out the door? And remember, in the end, even Dagny, even John Galt didn't get Jack Dagny Taggart. Why? Because he checked out. Because he was a vandal. He wasn't wrong, but he didn't have the right answer. Dagny was right. You go back and you fight. And yeah, it sucks, but you go back and you fight. I wanted to follow up on your comment about BRICS there and get your view on this supposed BRICS currency that's going to be released that is potentially partially backed by gold. Do you think this is something that could have an actual impact on international trade. You have people on one side on the extreme end saying it will completely disrupt the U.S. dollar's reserve currency. Other people like Brent Johnson who were saying the U.S. dollar is much, much more resilient than you're giving it credit for. Um, where do you stand on this announcement or semi-announcement so far on, on the BRICS currency? I, it's funny you asked that question because I literally just got done talking to Brent about this exact thing. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, Brent, you're up. Uh, the, what they'll wind up with, Brent... For the most part, and he even admitted this. And, and when the when the when the show comes out, you guys can listen to it. You know, when I brought it up, I said, "Look, I did a show with Vince Lanchi on Palisades Gold Radio, uh, with hosted by Tom Bodrovix, and Tom did a great job of letting of of letting Vince and I riff off of each other. And Vince, in part two of that podcast, because we went two and a half hours, um, lays out the mechanism by which you know there's a whole bunch of infrastructure that has to happen before you ever get to the point where you can have anything like like what we're like what people are talking about the best that you will get after the entire infrastructure is in place and the convenience premium of the US dollar is negative for a critical mass of people on this planet which it isn't it is for the Russians, it is for the Iranians, it is for the Venezuelans, it is for a few others. It's not there yet, and it never will be that much. And every time Yellen and company extend sanctions and make, it, make the dollar more expensive for them to use, who are they, who, who are they actually serving? I'll finish this, this statement in a second. Go back to my original argument about Davos. Who do they serve when they do that? They serve Davos because they serve the euro. Because what they're doing is they're lowering dollar demand. 
I got news for you guys. The whole de-dollarization thing is a Davos fucking psyop. Yeah, it's happening, but it's not happening at near the goddamn rate that the Pepe Escobars in the world want you to believe. Not that I'm, not that I'm saying the Pepe is, is, is Davos adjacent, because he's not. He's absolutely not. But he is, in, in a sense, their unwitting, useful idiot for arguing so strongly about how the empire of chaos is going to go down about this. He's wrong because he doesn't understand the plumbing of capital markets at all. I've talked with Pepe. I, I've been on the shows with him. I know. I like the man. But in, on this front, he's not a subject matter expert. He'd like to be, but he's not. Okay? And that's fine. It's fair. And he has his ideological bias, and he wants to see this happen. And that's fair. It's his emotional response. I don't even take it away. I don't even, like, I, no, I don't even, like, care. Like, I get it, dude. I, if I were you, I would get it. I, I would probably feel that way. But I'm not you. I see things a little differently. I see things as an, as an American victim of this system. Okay? Because I'm a victim of it, just like most Americans are, and just like you are. Now, the de-dollarization supports the European Union because it the Europe the euro is literally and the pound are the only antipodes in this sense for the dollar to Brent Johnson's point about well you know where's how is trade settled how is fine you know remember the British pound still settles 30 percent of all financial transactions in the world by the way the British pound without city of London there is no United Kingdom so you don't think that like the strength of the pound is dependent upon this idea of putting out a de-dollarization meme? And who controls the American media? Who controls the Twitter stream and the social media streams? The Brits and the Europeans. They are our media. They always have. Because they own, they control the they control the intelligence services, they control the State Departments, it's all this crap. They always have. So it's all this big goddamn psyop. When the reality is, is that yes, the Russians and the Chinese are tired of the uh, of the dollar hegemony, and so is Africa, so is South America, so is the Middle East, and everything else. But it's not that they're like hostile to it, like as a um, as a matter of exclusion. They still want to do business with the United States. There's no way we're not going to do business with them. So. The sanctions are actually counterproductive to the United States. And then you have to ask yourself, well, who benefits from the sanctions? Well, clearly, the BRICS are, clearly Europe does. And then clearly, at the other side of it, the BRICS, the rest of the global south, set, looks at the situation and goes, oh, look, the United States has gone nuts. And we have to protect ourselves. And eventually, that convenience premium will go away. And in the meantime, while that's happening, the entire infrastructure for a goal, for a for a, a quote-unquote trade settlement currency will be put in place. And if, and if the United States insists on World War III, i.e. the British and American neoconservatives and the Poles and the Lithuanians who are, insist on World War III, well then, once that system is in place, yes, they can turn around and go, you know what, nope, you're paying, you pay for commodities and gold or you don't get, you know, if you're friendly, you can pay in whatever you want. Local currency. Indonesian rupiah, Indian rupees, I don't care. But if you're unfriendly, fuck you, you get gold. You, you show up with gold or you get nothing. We don't want dollars. We don't care. Get over yourself. That's the... I mean, I'm not saying that anybody want, that they want to go there. They don't want to go there. If they wanted to go there, they could have already gone there. Okay? But if they did that in $1,900 gold, they would bankrupt themselves. So, no, because gold clearly should be much, much higher in order to settle all those trades. So, to your point, what they will eventually put in place and eventually have in place is nothing more than an accounting system where they, as Vince put it in the podcast, will still denominate everything in dollars. Oil will still be quoted in dollars. Copper will still be quoted in dollars. They'll trade in whatever currency they want, and they'll settle the, the trade balances in digital gold credits and debits, and they'll settle up every quarter, and maybe they, they'll move a little bit of gold around the, around the world. And the, gold, the World Gold Council will track it, because they're really not talking about a lot of tonnage, especially if we're talking about you know gold being slowly reintroduced into the monetary system 
And that's and this is the mechanism by which you do it. You do they do that on their end and paying for commodities. We do it on our end with you know gold convertibility, slowly reintroducing gold back into the monetary system the way we did before. That's what's going to happen. And that is going to take the rest of my lifetime to implement. Unless there's a catastrophic event, a la Martin Armstrong's arguments about a big crescendo into 2032. Again, I, I'm not I'm not I'm neither endorsing nor uh, debunking Marty's predictions or Marty's Marty's cycles or analysis. I'm saying, okay, if that's out there on your horizon, you know, you know, barring a, a catalytic event, a catastrophic event in the mathematical sense of the term, then, you know, this is what I see to be on the horizon. It may even have to be a series of catastrophic events that gets us even to that point where we can then start to have those things happen. And maybe that's what, and that's maybe, you know, the transition from this, from what we currently have to what we're going to wind up with has to have these series of catastrophic events where certain people, certain factions refuse to, you know, stay down, refuse to submit. And I don't expect anybody to submit. And so because I don't expect anybody to submit, I expect this to be as ugly as possible. And that, on that point, Brent and I completely agree. And um, so we'll see what happens. So I heard you re mention recently as well that oil is the new gold. So I wanted to get your forecast for oil, how you see its role up ahead. And you also men mentioned that industrial metals are, are another area where you're very bullish on. So maybe you could tie that into the conversation as well and let us know your thoughts there. So oil is the new gold is, a, is just another way of saying, look, the most manipulated market on the planet right now is oil. It used to be gold. When we were in the, the when we were at the zero bound, it was it was gold, right? If you can keep the gold price under control, then you can hide the monetary inflation and and all the rest of it. As long as you, because the markets will oh well, gold's not breaking out, so I guess you know, everything's fine. Um, that's no longer the case. The Fed doesn't care one whit about gold. Well, I don't even think the, the the Fed cares about oil. But everybody that I've outlined on this show so far that does have a problem with the current situation can't stand the idea of a price of the price of oil rising why because how does Lagarde at the ECB manage credit spreads and get inflation down if oil prices are rising because oil prices are most of what you're dealing with in terms of inflation this is a commodity cost push inflationary environment it is not a credit based demand pull environment so you can't fix inflation with interest rates in a commodity cost push environment. Period. Can't do it. It's a supply. It's a supply side problem with a demand side tool. I've been saying this since they before they started raising interest rates. I said this before COVID blew out. It's like the first is one of the first, very first issues of Ultimate Wealth Report. I wrote for Newsmax when I went back to work for them. I talked about this exact thing, and I said even if the Fed starts to raise interest rates. It's not going to solve any incipient inflation because we have a cost push inflationary problem because of COVID. So that's where we are. That's coming back. That's we're going to get another wave of it. There's no way around it because the supply and demand mismatches within the global economy after having destroyed the global economy through COVID, it's going to come back in in waves, you just, it's like, it, I know, it's compressions and rarefactions, man. It's just waves. It's just, you know, we're going to get out some inflation and it's going to recede and then it's going to go out and it's going to do this. And it's like, you know, a decaying sine wave or, you know, however you want to put it, right? Um, throw a stone in a pond and watch the ripples. You know, we're through ripple one. We haven't gone through ripple two or three or four. And so it's going to take another couple of iterations of this to get rid of it and getting and, and working that out and tamping down on credit-based assets will help the situation along. It will expedite us getting through the process and tamping down the, um, the amplitude of each peak of inflation. But it's still coming and there's no way in around it. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about industrial metals, which all take their cues off of, off of energy or grains or softs or doesn't matter 
the energy complex, the, the metals complex, the lumber complex, you know, whatever, the, the, the grain, you know, it doesn't matter. They're all going to go through it because they're all downstream of the price of energy. And I'm not, I'm, we're not on the verge of some new energy technology that's going to, you know, we're not going to get an Epstein drive like in the expanse where we went from, you know, nothing to orders of magnitude, you know, super technology. We're not going to get hyper, we're not going to, you know, get hyperspace or anything like that. There isn't any cold fusion out there. Blah, 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 blah. What there's going to be is oil for the next 50 years while we work out the next generation of proper nuclear technology. It's probably going to take another 20 or 30 years minimum to get the thorium, the thorium-232 slash uranium-233 cycle into the mix simply because it's been so underfunded for so long that that's the only thing on the horizon that I can even see unless we do get to some kind of controllable fusion situation. If that happens, great. I'm I'm not going to live to see it. So, you know, oil is going to be with us. Energy is going to be tight and it's going to be what it is. I don't think we're staring at peak oil. I've never been a peak oil guy. I'm, a, I'm not a Malthusian in any way. I, I think that if oil rises to a certain price, well, look, we'll see the thorium cycle invested in really quickly and we won't be at peak oil anymore. We'll stop burning the shit and we'll start using it for materials, which is where it's far more useful. And thorium, which has got no other uses, should actually be on the, should actually be being the thing being burned. That being said, um, we're dealing with that and we're going to, we're going to deal with commodity cost push inflation all through 20, the rest of 2023, as it returns into 2024, oil is going back over a hundred dollars a barrel minimum. And with it, it'll take the rest of the commodity complex up, not probably to the same heights that we saw in certain markets, um, post COVID, but we'll see, um, another bull market. And even if we are in a recession in the United States, it will be even worse because we'll have supply breakdowns that are far worse because of the the internal fragility of the complex. As we get into the complex systems breakdown, yeah, um, it's going to be crazy what's going to happen. But it's going to be complex systems breakdown in places in the first world while complex systems are being built in the third world, what is now the third world. And if they can overthrow the yoke of things like, again, Think about Africa. Think about what happens in Africa if, they, if those 14 countries throw out the CFA franc and can keep 90% of the profit off of their uranium and gold mining as opposed to five. What happens to that country overnight? And what can they build? And what, what does their demand curve look like? So I just think there's this just too many people that have not fully moved into the middle class in Asia and Africa and South America to even give to give zero more than zero fucks about what happens to a marginal 3% decline in the demand for oil here in the United States. I just don't buy it. Just don't buy it. And then, and by the way, that's not happening right now. Oil production in the United States is flatlining. Exports are falling and imports are rising. And that's into a recession because it's a credit basis recession and a white collar uh, unemployment problem not a blue collar unemployment problem. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tom. It was an awesome conversation. I learned a lot, but before I let you go, um, for people who want to learn more, could you tell us about the Gold, Goats, and Guns website um, and anywhere else you want to direct people online? Sure. So the, the heart of the service really is at, pay, is at Patreon. The blog is the public front uh, where we write there and, you know, right there as, as often as I can. We do a podcast as well, which again is publicly available and free. But the uh, the the heart of the service is through Patreon, uh, Patreon slash Gold Goats and Guns, where we do I do uh, a twice weekly rant like this over slides for my uh, my people, along with um, private blog posts where I pre digest most of my public writing, and we do a monthly newsletter as well. It's a twelve page, ten to twelve page um, investment report. You know the standard kind of retail. Uh, investor focused uh, investment newsletter with all bespoke uh, writing, portfolio review, unique editorials, and where we're most, where my, my partner, Dexter White, and I are, are most forward looking. So, with that said, I know I'm already, already kind of always forward looking anyway, but this is where we tend, we try to be the most forward looking, is in the newsletter. So, that's what we do. Great. Well, I'll put links to all that in the description below for anybody who wants to check that out. Thank you once again for joining us, Tom, and sharing all your knowledge with the audience. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.